Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. October is a very busy month. We honor Pink October, Hispanic Heritage, and Filipino American History Month. In order to give myself a bit of a mental health break, I'm going to be sharing some episodes that you might have missed. This interview was recorded five years ago in celebration of my mom's 70th birthday. We discuss her experience with breast cancer and her healing process. My mom did not opt for chemotherapy, but instead healed with her strong spirit and practiced the ancient art form of Tai Chi Chuan. We, of course, do not recommend this for everyone, but listen on to hear her survival story. We also go back in time and discuss her music career in Jamaica that led her to the United States. I love hearing about her life as a singer on the road, and she shares some fun stories of her adventures. Ironically, one of those stories is about Elvis Presley, and I just happened to have watched the film Elvis. If you have seen the film and listened to this podcast, please share who you think her mystery driver was, because I certainly have my suspicions. I'm grateful for all of these conversations, and I hope you've been enjoying them. If you are, please rate my podcast on your platform of choice and share it with others. If you would like to support the work I do with a donation and help keep this podcast going, you can become a patron of the show by visiting my website or patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan. For comments or suggestions, reach out on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan. Now on with the show. All right. I'm joined with my mom today. Hi, mom. Hi, Mimi. <laughs> Obviously, this month I mentioned that in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I would be interviewing a lot of survivors of breast cancer to you know, promote the awareness. And as usual, I will link everything in the websites so that listeners can learn more about the cause and learn more about what they can do to help. There's a lot of fundraisers. There's the Race for the Cure and a lot of different things that are there to help, but also so that we can be preventive so that other other people can make sure that they are ahead of it and, um, you know, getting their mammograms and, and whatnot. So I'm joined with my mom today to share a little bit about her story and her experience with breast cancer so that we can inspire and motivate others to do the right thing. So um, why don't we just kind of start with um, the beginning, obviously you're a very, very healthy person. You're one of nine and probably the healthiest of all of your siblings. So what, when did you discover or what was your origin story for finding out that you had breast cancer? Well, October is breast cancer month and it always reminds me of when I had my breast cancer in um, September of 1994, which I was only 47, I decided to take a mammogram, just a routine mammogram. Um, based on that, uh, actually it was before, three years prior, I, um, I took the breast cancer uh, mammogram and it showed that I was fine. Um, in the second year, I did it again. They said I was fine. At that time, I found a lump. And uh, I mentioned it to them, but they kept saying I was fine um, with just the mammogram. Um, finally, because of an accident, um, I went to the doctor, and the doctor mentioned that um, she checked, oh, checked my breast cancer. Uh, I checked my breast and um, immediately sent me to have an ultrasound. So based on the ultrasound, that's when they found out that I had cancer. I see. And I think, you know, obviously, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, your decision to write a book. But I think I remember in reading in your book, your friend, um, Dr. Kwan, also kind of urged you because you had mentioned that you had a lump. And so, you know, the first time you told them and they said it was fine, you pretty much kind of took that at face value that, you know, well, the doctors know what they're talking about. They said, I'm fine. So you really didn't think anything of it at first, correct? Right. Right, but basically I, it was the radiologist that I was telling. It was not necessarily the doctor, but they did send the report to the doctor. Unfortunately, the, the, um, the mammogram, which is not very accurate, uh, at the very bottom it says um, there's 20% error. 
I never received any report, so I didn't read that before. And of course, most of us would not take note of that fine line saying that there's 20% chance of not having it. So when I finally saw the report, eventually then I noted that um, because of that small print, um, there's nothing that can be done because they said you're fine, but in small print, there is always that 20% chance of inaccuracy. So in the long run, there's nothing we can actually do. So my suggestion to most people would say, if you do have a lump, to make sure you um, stress that you get extra testing like the ultrasound on your own if they don't even recommend it or diagnose, um, give a prescription for it. Yeah, because pretty much you didn't have any breast cancer um, in the family, so that also didn't give you any indication you needed to request an ultrasound or do anything further than, oh, well, my mammogram came back, so to speak, clear. But you did actually do your personal um, examination and from your doctor that you know you had felt something there. Right. So what did that feel like? Um, it's just like a small lump, but... Um, it, it, it's, it's not easy to de detect because actually I have what they call um, fibrous type of breast and it, it was hidden behind. That's why it didn't show up in the mammogram. So you really need an expert and go through the ultrasound. Not only the mammogram, but the ultrasound was the final test that showed the breast cancer. Right. So, I mean, in, in terms of suggestions, not that I'm a medical professional, but, you know, if you do detect any difference, so we urge women all the time to do their own personal exams. They say to do it at the same, you know, time of the month all the time so that you can actually get like a comparison. Often, maybe if you're in the shower or something so that you have kind of a reference point that's always the same time of, of, of the month. And that way you're, you're kind of comparing all of that because, you know, there are changes in your tissue and there are changes as our women go through hormonal changes so that's the first suggestion and obviously if you find something that's a little bit off it just doesn't hurt to be safe I think exactly well now I know that of course at the time we said there is no history they said you were fine um, you don't really um, most people anyway don't yeah. go out away if the doctor and the and the test says you're fine so even like in um, not only breast cancer but any any um, symptoms you have, I think you should, because the doctor can only go by what you tell them. So I, I think it's more important, even stress, that I would like you to, you know, give me more testing. I think we should stre um, stress on that because most doctors, you are a number and they see so many patients. And if you don't stress that, they would say, okay, you know, you did your mammogram and you're fine. But if you yourself um, feel a lump or anything at all suspicious, then I suggest you tell the doctor to give me more tests. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously with our history, you know, for those listeners that don't know, my sister Tina has a long history of being in the hospital and we we know we have to be advocates for her. We have to be our own advocates as patients because like you said, doctors really, it's not that they're bad doctors, it's just they're so consumed with the numbers of people they see. And I think you can't always just go by um, what they're telling you. You know, we've kind of often found that in our experience with the doctors and history of, of being in hospitals like you really have to be an advocate for yourself so I think there is that assi assi insistence that you go ahead and get that ultrasound if you you know feel like there is something abnormal you know and there's nothing that's kind of once you request that they can't really say no you can't get that so it, it's always better to be safe I think obviously we don't want people to be neurotic about it but it's always better to be safe basically um, it has a lot to do with insurance they do the mammogram because that's routine. And because of insurance, they cannot say do a mammogram and an ultrasound. So you have to take that initiative to make sure that you stress on it because of, in, especially for insurance purposes. Once you tell the doctor that, they have no choice but to give you further testing because in the long run, you can say, 
I asked for it and you did not give it to me. So it's on their head. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, you you know, what was it like for you, though? You know, being, like I said, just really healthy. You're a Tai Chi practitioner and, and master, and you take care of yourself. You, you eat relatively well, and you just, you know, you're, you're always kind of on the go. Um, what was it like for you when they actually did diagnose you? I mean, what did you go through emotionally? Were you in any sort of denial, or what, what did that feel like for you at the time? Denial was the first thing. Because going into the operation, I still thought there was nothing wrong with me because I was healthy. I, I didn't feel the sick. And, um, you know, the, the, the doctor, um, because of the ultrasound, it seemed as if they know and it's almost proof that there is. Because I said to the doctor, um, instead of just doing a biopsy and then after the biopsy do the surgery, I said, Let's do the biopsy, and if, um, if anything, and you find anything, do the surgery right away. But before we did that, I said to him, how can you tell if it was cancerous? And he said, if you open the window and it's sunny, and the sun is shining, it's just the same way. You know, the sun is shining. So based on that, I went ahead and did the biopsy and the surgery at the same time. So I went in not even knowing if I truly had cancer. I see. So basically what they tell you is, okay, we have detected the lump. We feel it could or could not be cancerous. We need to do a biopsy, which means they open up and take a tissue sample. But basically once they open up, he's telling you, we're going to know once we look at it. Right. And at that point you had an option of get the biopsy done, close you up, give you the news, then you make a decision. But you had kind of made a decision. Oh, yes. Definitely. I was not going to do a lumpectomy. I just said, if I had cancer, take it off. Right. And so when you say that, um, instead of having a lumpectomy, which means you only remove the tissue that is to be cancerous and some of the surrounding, or you basically would have a mastectomy, which would mean you take off the entire breast and all tissue um, that could even be, uh, in, quote unquote, infected. Right. Because they said with a cancerous cell, you can even miss a minute portion of it. And then, of course, we'll come back um, even worse than before. So based on those odds, I said it's best to do the biopsy. And then I knew that I would have done the mastectomy. So there was no two ways about it. So of course, when I went in, I still did not know that this was going to happen. But it, I, so I was out the entire day. And when I woke up, that's when they told me that it was cancerous. Okay, so basically on the flip side of it, you were in surgery and, you know, obviously being your daughter, I was there at the hospital and I remember being there with the family and I remember the surgeon coming out halfway through and he said, yes, you know, it was cancer. And of course, when we got that news, it was, it was shocking, you know, and he said, but don't worry, we, you know, we're removing everything and we have direction of what we want to do. And then he went in and did it. And, and it, I mean, I don't remember how many hours it just, it was so long ago now, but it, I mean, it felt like an all day thing. It was there. because I woke up late at night um, because they had problems closing me up because I had dry skin and I didn't have enough elasticity in my skin. So it was hard for them to close me up. Um, in addition, um, maybe new technology, they would have done a better job because this was some 20 something years ago. So I remembered, um, I, uh, my husband told me that I was so white because I was under so long and what I went through, it, it was really scared for me. So that's why I remember going early in the morning and I said, see you soon. And before you know it, I didn't wake up till late, late in the evening. Yeah, and they also removed lymph nodes. Yeah, they took out, I think it was 17 lymph nodes. To me, I think it was that anticipation when they removed the lymph nodes to find out if there was any spreading, I think that was harder and more scary because at the time when I did the uh, mastectomy before, 
I didn't think I had cancer. So, it, I mean, of course the news was bad and you feel um, really horrible about it, but in my mind I still think, didn't think it was possible. But then when it's cancerous and then you take the lymph nodes, it took quite some time before you get the results. And I think that was the hardest wait for me. And so we'll, we'll talk about post-op um, and recovery in a second, but basically for most people, I think there's a really long and thought out debate and decision of, of getting a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. I think a lot of women go through- And reconstructive. And reconstructive, right? So, so the choices are, you know, you get the lumpectomy, which is just removing the lump. You get a mastectomy, which is removing your entire breast. And then you have a choice at that point, you know, to be closed up and leave it as is or to get reconstructive. Um, and I think a lot of women go through kind of an emotional, you know, woman, like, you know, losing womanhood or losing a part of them. Right. I mean, for you, it seemed like a very definitive decision. You're like, if it's cancer, just take everything off and I'm good with that. I mean, um, why was that so definitive for you? Or did you go through a bit of an emotional debate in your mind? I think for me personally, it's not for everybody. Um, I feel if you have a problem, you fix it and you do it a hundred percent. And I felt lumpectomy was 50%. Then with the reconstructive uh, operation, the surgery, um, again, for me, um, I've heard so many horror stories that sometimes the, um, the, uh, the type of things that they use, um, sometimes it leak. Then you the get silicone. infection, right, the silicone or whatever they use. Of course, again, 20 something years later, they may have improved on it. But at the time, I've heard a lot of horror stories. So A, I want to fix it 100% and B, I already have a big problem. Why give myself more problem if there is going to be future problem with the silicone? Right. So, so, so it was, for you, it wasn't as difficult a decision because you're so pragmatic, I guess. <laughs> yes. I'm very straightforward. Yeah. It's do or die. <laughs> right. Right. I, I, and, and, you know, and like, again, like you said, it's, it's such a personal decision, but I, I really just wanted to understand, you know, kind of your thought process. So, uh, I do remember that night and it was very late and, you know, uh, I didn't get to see you as early as my, as dad did for post-op. So I remember though, you're right. He's just he said it was how, white. how white you were. Yeah. yeah. That's just so much blood loss. And, yeah, yeah. and, and for those who don't know, or haven't seen, you know, my movie or know what my mom looks like, you know, well, there'll be pictures and everything, but she does, you know, have a skin condition where she's got the eczema and it's very dry. And so that also um, maybe was a good choice to not deal with reconstructive because they already had such an issue. They didn't have to graft your skin, but I remember that was a consideration. But again, he worked on me and um, the, the, the doctor that used, um, he's really a burnt specialist. So... Um, he tried his best and which he did pull the skin from the back to the front and also under my arm so to this day i still feel a lot of discomfort so i have to stretch it a lot every day as a matter of fact, so one of the first things they tell you post, post op is, you know, pretty much almost immediately, they want you up and moving right away. They don't want you to be stagnant. They want, don't want you to just lay around for a week. I mean, I would even say like hours after or a day, like the next day, they want you moving. And what, and what they did with you, I remember we had a piece of tape on the wall in our house and it, we had little like tick marks of how high you could lift your arm. And everyone always says, oh, is this your growth chart? And I'm like, look how high it goes. Obviously, I'm not seven feet tall or whatever you know because it's above where I'm at it's actually we had a tape on the wall and it had little marks and it was how high you would lift your arm every day like you would basically right. scale your hand up the wall and it took a long time I don't remember I, how long. I really thought he glued my hand to my side when I came out I said what did he do to my arm 
I could I could just go like this, just move my fingers to start. I couldn't even move my arm. So every day I would creep up and up and up. And finally, you know, I could do the reach. But again, to this day, I still have discomfort. Yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately, I think that's just part of it was the complication with your skin condition. I mean, like you said. Yeah, maybe it should. Maybe they should have done grafting would have helped but since we didn't and maybe that's why i still feel the discomfort yeah 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 and so it's been great though because it's been 23 years Mm -hmm. you know already you're going to be 70 this year yes actually this will actually release on your birthday so really (laughs) ironically (laughs) yeah so this today would actually be your your birthday it will release we're doing um you know breast cancer awareness and everything will be october and i think this actually falls directly on your birthday so you'll be 70 at the end of uh, um breast cancer on october 31 the last day Mm -hmm. and so um we'll be you know doing a, a finale episode here but so you know, and obviously you're you're very lucky. What is it like um, to check that remission for you? So, like, you know, after that first year, how often do they say right after you have it that you have to check up? It was quite often. It, I think we started at three months, and then thereafter six months, and then thereafter every year. But for the first few years, we do a diagnostic mammogram which means that when they take um, the mammogram, a doctor would look at it right away and then decide if we should do an ultrasound. And the first few years, I did an ultrasound in addition to the mammogram till maybe after about three to five years, we stopped doing the ultrasound and just do the diagnostic mammogram, which a doctor looks at it immediately. And if it looks suspicious, then they let me do the ultrasound. Right. And what was it like for you, you know, maybe the first three months going back? Was there a lot of fear that maybe it had spread or that it would come back? Once they said the um, lymph nodes were clear, um, I felt more reassured that it was okay. Um, but most people that have breast cancer, they always worry about it being on the left side. Mine was on the right. Because most people, once they have it on the right, sometimes it goes, you get it on the left. And others have made the choice if they have a, um, a general, um, what you call that uh, hereditary. hereditary type um, if the mother or the father or somebody had cancer they would remove both breasts but I didn't think that was necessary mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and so obviously very fortunate was there any point in maybe from hearing that you might have it up until once you found out you had it and then like I know you said there was relief with the lymph nodes but I mean did you really think or have that fear of you know like everyone says oh the c word of cancer I mean did it have like that wane effect of you of like you would die or there would be he, well yes but I didn't give myself um, time for that because I found out over the weekend I think it was like Friday and when he called me and he said um, I just left the office and he said well, I would like to see you again so I went back down but he at that time he told me that he think it's cancer so when I went back and I spoke with the doctor immediately immediately I said to him there is no two ways about it. Let's do the biopsy. So I think we did the biopsy either the following Tuesday, like Monday you go to, you know, blood testing, all that operation. And Tuesday I was in the hospital room. So I just had that weekend to make it sink in. So I didn't get much thought and say one week later two weeks later let's what to do i said nope as soon as i went to his office and he said i think it's cancerous let's do the biopsy and of course if the biopsy is positive then you do the mastectomy right so i mean it's kind of almost a positive thing that you just kind of went one two three everything was done i'm like that i've always been like that i never hem and haw about important things Okay, and so let's talk a little bit about your healing process because obviously you wrote a book and, and your Tai Chi, 
you you opted not to do chemo, which of course is again we're not recommending anything for anybody else. This is just my mom's personal story. But she, you know, you opted not to do chemo. You tried some medicines, or right. I believe because I but you um, said you had such. She's so highly allergic. There was right. like a lot of issues. I was allergic to tamoxifen, and then they tried the um, megase megase. So. Both times I was allergic, um, so we when, stopped doing any. When you were allergic, what, what happened? Oh, break out in rashes, yeah. And of course, they said nobody's allergic to the democracy, and I said, well, I am, you know. But um, with the megase, it's a possibility that I still had some of the tamoxifen in me as to, but I, I decided not to. And then they asked me about experimental, um, you know, like sugar or another thing, which, which I, you know, I think it was, no, before they said if we want to experiment whether I do the sugar or the tamoxifen, but I would not know if which one it was, and I said, no, I would not go with that kind of testing. I said, just give me the tamoxifen, which would have been for five years. Well, that didn't work out. So then my other alternative was um, I went up to Boston, and um, the oncologist told me that um, another option was to remove the ovaries. Uh, by removing the ovaries, you don't produce the estrogen that so-called cancer was feeding on. So I opted for that because, again, a surgery is removing it and removing the food. I thought that was the best option than chemo because chemo removes and kill all good and bad cells. And the little good cells you have, you don't want to kill it for some bad cells. So I said, let's remove the food and not remove the good cells. So that's why I chose that option. And, and I think there's a stigma, too, with chemo, especially of not just the hair loss and the physical sickness, but the weakness that it puts your whole body through. I think that's very um, almost as scary as the cancer itself. It, most people go through a lot with chemo because the white blood cells take over the red and then you get a, a low immune system. As a matter of fact, the person they told me to call to see if they, you know, they were taking chemo at the time. She was in a hospital because the white blood cells had taken over. So I said, what a, um, uh, a choice they want me to make. When that person was in a hospital, I said, there is no way I would make that choice. And besides my um, obstetrician, he said, if you do chemo, it's like, um, you remember that phrase? burning down the house to catch fleas. And I said, I don't want to burn down my house, so let's just do the operation and take out the ovaries. And it's called oophorectomy. Right, right, yeah, the oophorectomy. So lots of surgeries in now, and we, we feel like we've you know pretty much um, gotten rid of everything. Let's talk a little bit about the healing process that you know was pretty homeopathic at this point. You basically turned to your internal um, art form of Tai Chi to really heal. Definitely. As a matter of fact, because of my arm being the way it was, if it weren't for Tai Chi, um, I would still have more problems. So what was that regiment like for you? Um, again, besides my hand creeping up the wall, I did a lot of the stretching of the arms up in the air type of thing, fall down. Um, all different directions to make sure we loosen it up, otherwise it'd be very stiff. Yeah, and you know, you did of course write the book, The Taiji World of Susie Chan, um, you know, and how you healed with faith and exercise. Now, but you did a lot of specific exercises every day other than just the stretching. You did the actual form or did you just do the qigong breathing? What was it? I, I would say a combination of everything. Really, I, I would do the stretching first, then I'd do with the Tai Chi. As a matter of fact, 
that was the time period I feel my Tai Chi improved because I made sure that I do it every single day while before you always teaching and you kind of concentrate on the students and not yourself. So during the time period of healing, my Tai Chi really improved because I spent time with myself. Yeah, and then for those who don't know what Tai Chi is, basically we like to describe it as meditation in motion. Um, and and now medication in motion. And also medication <laughs> in motion, especially in your case. And you know, Especially today, meditation is such a buzzword, and I think it is important, but I think it's also people should realize that it doesn't mean you have to become this Buddhist monk who sits on the top of a mountain and tries to clear their mind and think of nothing for hours. I think meditation takes so many forms, and I think ultimately it's breathing, you know, learning to breathe properly, finding that time for yourself to right. do things that put your mind at ease. And for you, obviously, that is Tai Chi. You're in your own mind. You're, you know, just focusing on that motion and that movement and that breathing, and it's very therapeutic for you. Right. Like, I mean, like like some people find um, playing cards with other people or doing you know different you know activities but for me my Tai Chi is what saved my life uh, my hobby and um, something I love very much so I'm lucky that I have this exercise program to fall back on and it helps my health yeah, I mean, it didn't hurt you also already were pretty much a master at that point. And then, of course, our, my dad is also a martial artist. And we, it's just been in our family for so long. But now for you also, I feel like the Tai Chi, um, it just became kind of a part of you and a part of, of who you are and what you do. It's not just like a hobby. You know, it's right. really well, your, That's why I wrote the book, How I Survived Cancer with faith and exercise. I use the word survive because I really think Tai Chi helped me to survive. And I'm able to celebrate 70 years. Yeah, and, year. <laughs> yeah and happy birthday. And so the doctor also, I think rem I remember saying he was so surprised at your miraculous recovery and how quick and efficient it he was. He said, what have you been doing? I said, Tai Chi said, continue doing it. Yes, because he, he, he really thought when I went back to him that he would have to do another operation and graft. And uh, because of the exercises that I did, he didn't have to do the grafting then. Really awesome. And, and I think um, it's you know, more notable now and that people recommend it for post-op of anything, not just cancer, but any post-op and, and just as a rehab program. But also, I think people are missing the point of waiting until there's a problem and then trying to fix it. I think the preventive is what we really need to focus on now. And I mean, of course, at Walam, that's what we focus on is their Kung Fu preventive. and Tai Chi and yeah. uh, you know, Oscar with his fitness. My husband does the personal training. And we, we try to tell people, look, you want to pay for your health now with preventive and invest in your body versus waiting and paying hospital bills because you will pay for your right. health Definitely. one way or another. Right. That's guaranteed. If you do preventive, it also helps you to not have to take all these different pills that have so many side effects. Like if you're, you know, diabetic, you have to take this, you know, this, or your high blood pressure, if they take high blood pressure pills, you have high cholesterol, if they have high cholesterol pills, but each one of these pills have so many side effects. So why not take some time, 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, to do some form of exercise, and it will help you prevent not having all these uh, help anyway, not to have these sickness that you have to take pills that have a lot of side effects. Yeah, and you're obviously a very strong and independent and strong-willed person, and you were able to get through this, you know, of course with family support and your Taiji, but you yourself are very self-healing in the fact that, you know, you're, you're very... Um, decisive and you make you make your decisions and once you've done that you, you're able to move forward but a lot of people um, process differently you know a lot of people need maybe support groups or therapies and and you know um, need to go about things different so I definitely also urge everyone that you know find what works for you because there are a million 
types of support groups, whether it's a Taiji class or a, a forum. I mean, they have the, the, the positives of social media. I often kind of get a little kitschy about social media, but the positives are there are forums out there and, you know, Facebook groups that, you know, people can share stories and you have, you know, empathy and people that understand what you're going through. And, and you've also counseled people who, you know, maybe finding out for the first time, right. want to talk to a survivor. Needs, right. I've helped people that uh, have breast cancer. I've gone with them to see their doctor and oncologist because I have gone through it. I'll be able to help them. Yeah, so, even just the terminology sometimes right. is overwhelming. It is. It, it's so difficult, uh, especially when you hear something like this and it's something new. Uh, you do need somebody that has gone through it to help you through it and to help you even take you to the doctor and give them some comfort. Yeah. yeah, I think I think also if you're the patient, because even you, as strong as you are, if you're the patient, you need someone there right. that's Always. really listening, yeah. asking questions, because you're the one trying to process, wait, what? I have cancer. I mean, you're not even going to be able to hear as clearly as you want. I think it's important to have family support and have someone there or have a friend that, you know, can, can be an advocate for you. Because even though you're as strong as you are, I think it's important that, you know, we all have kind of that support. Or what we is, all do now, as a matter of fact, um, even Tai Chi is not a cure-all, um, but it is also a form of um, getting to know other people, being with a group, and doing some exercise together, and um, improving on the health. So it's not just doing the exercise, but also meeting other people, having support, and other people, and we have like a family at Walam, so um, it is so good that it can come and do Tai Chi and meet new people. And some people already ha um, have breast cancer that have been to Walam, so I, I think it, it has helped them a lot. Yeah, I mean, well, it's proven, actually, science has proven that socialization and being co in communities um, equals longevity. Right. You know, the difference between uh, us being civilized is that we began to socialize, right. you know, and so that uh, building of a community in society is actually what propels us forward to last longer. I mean, that's that's proven by science already. So I think it's very important that, you know, if you do get this news, you know, definitely don't be afraid to share it. Don't try to harbor it on your right. own. Uh, you know, I think alone is a worst. You get depressed, you get sad, you think about it, you think it's the end of the world. But then when you associate yourself with positive people around you, then you kind of draw from that. And that helps you get through the word cancer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there is, uh, you know, obviously, you know, professional support out there, you know, for those that are, 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 you know, scared to, you know, talk to a friend or a neighbor or a family member, you know, there's, there's a lot of different resources. And I definitely urge everybody to find the one that works for them the best. You right. Know? I, I personally feel if somebody has cancer is to find another person who has had cancer, because sometimes even with, um, a nurse or a support group, if they have not been through cancer, um, it's hard for them to understand how you feel. So if you go to somebody else who have had cancer or even similar type of cancer, like breast cancer or go to um, a group or somebody you know have breast cancer, I think that's the most helpful thing of all because you've gone through it, you can let them know how you feel and how what we know what they are going through. With support groups, sometimes if the person who is leading the support group have not gone through it, they will not be as helpful as another person I've gone to. Cancer. Yeah, I think most support groups usually consist yeah. of um, survivors as well. But also, you know, the professional training, I think, is, is, is also really key because sometimes that objectivity can really help you know others as well but um to your point obviously empathy is is one of the best things of knowing that someone has been through what you have been through um at the same time i feel that um a lot of people now the awareness is higher. So we're looking at, you know, Breast Cancer Month, Breast Cancer Awareness. I've talked to some um, really great people this month about um, their experiences and they've shared their stories. And, you know, it, it seems to be a reoccurring theme to me that, you know, once you're through it, 
you you kind of live life maybe a little bit differently. You know, the one one of the women I spoke to, she changed her entire career and ended up jo- jo- you know going into her passion of authoring and became a best selling author because she just decided, well, let me start something as a hobby of getting my mind off things, pulling me out of that sadness, or getting me healthy. And it's changed lives. I mean, has there been anything life changing for you um, after having cancer that that kind of put you on a new path or a new focus in your life? Not really, except like I mentioned that I used to take care of um, people teaching Tai Chi. And then when I had cancer, I started taking care of myself more so doing Tai Chi. And my Tai Chi got better. So I would say maybe I have um, become more involved with the Tai Chi and not only teaching, but taking care of myself also. So I believe um, it's more important that you take care of yourself first and so that you'll be able to take care of others. Yeah, I mean, that's what they say on the plane. You know, put your oxygen mask on yeah. first yeah. or you can't help the person yeah. next to you. So, so true. Yeah, and I think that's often what gets us in this situation. I mean, you don't know why you got cancer, right? A lot of people don't know why. They don't know the causes. But I feel that um, being wrapped up in, in the work too much and stress, stress is probably the the silent killer, right? People don't well, I remember realize. I went through um, my... Um, having Tina with just being born 800 grams which is about 1.8 ounces and that alone being in the hospital for four and a half months and thereafter for the first year in the hospital every single month with either pneumonia or um, operation for the, the surgery for the hydrocephalus and thereafter, years after, every three years or so, she has another operation. That alone was the most stressful time in my life. And who knows? Who knows? You know? Yeah, like a cell could have, um, yeah. I guess, ignited because of, right. of, of all that stress. I mean, not just the physical stress, because obviously, you know, you had Tina and, you know, but then, you know, the emotional and and stress that kind of weighs on you. And you when you're in fight or flight mode, your body will do it. You know, you made it through with Tina. You were able to be there and, and be functioning and do what you had to do. But there's always a cost. You know, right. we don't so see it we right don't away. Know. But there's yeah. always a cost and there's always a trade off. I mean, let's talk actually a little bit about Tina. I mean, it's not um, necessarily your cancer story, but I think it's a part of who you are and what's made you as strong as you were to maybe get through the cancer. Maybe because of what you had been through with Tina, pretty much she was told, you were told when she was born that she wasn't going to make it. Less you know, than 10%. Less than 10%. Ten percent, less than ten percent. You had a, a priest give her her last rites, and right. you know, there's a movie on this, by the way, guys, that I will link. It's it's an award-winning <laughs> film. We can't come through Pioneer you, if you haven't seen it yet. But it, there, there's so much to it that I think. Maybe with your, you know, because people might think, wow, you know, listening to this podcast, oh, it was so easy for you to process cancer. And not that it was easy to diminish that experience, but maybe because you had already been through so much, you were like, well, it's just something I see and I'm going to take care of it right away. Because with Tina, it was a long, drawn out process of what, what you just it's mentioned. Been years and even up to this day, I always wonder, and you know, if the shunt is not going to work or she's going to have blockage in the stomach. So to this day, it's a a daily thing. Yeah, so you... It's a daily thing. The irony then is that, you know, um, now that you feel like you've taken care of yourself and you're healing and you've healed, you've been in remission 23 years, you actually don't have any fears of the cancer coming back. I never look back. I never look... People should always look forward. And because fear gives you cancer. I think fear gives you cancer. Stress gives you cancer. So why give yourself cancer? Two things you must not dwell on. Going back in the past, um, at the end of my book, if you recall, um, I said, I have no yesterdays. Time took it away. Tomorrow may not be, but I have today. Yeah. You remember that phrase? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I believe in that. We have today. Don't look back on what happened 
just you have that day you live the, to, the day to the fullest yeah no absolutely and so with tina now you know you you mentioned that it's kind of like a daily worry that you know yes, her yeah. condition may change um you know thank goodness she's been so healthy up until this point and she's also you know that the wong slash chan women are, are quite the <laughs> stubborn and strong various types yes. <laughs> yeah but um so but with tina you know I, like i said i just wanted to share with our listeners a little bit they can you know review the film and stuff and hear more about that story and what you shared but uh i think that also made you the strong person you are today as well i've always been strong but i think it made me stronger yeah yeah tina's experience of course um was very unlike <laughs> the conventional um right. conventional story so she you know her her survival of course you know my dear sister i don't think she would ever sit with me for a podcast i don't think i'll ever get an interview out <laughs> <I> of her <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to spend 10 hours <laughs> Get one word yeah, she, uh, in, in processes. Yeah. yeah, she has her own way of processing, but she's always watching and she's always learning. Oh, so. she listens. She listens and then makes her remark. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I always kind of wrap up our podcast with, you know, this is culture chat and I like to talk a little bit about, um, tradition or, or something that kind of means something to you. So for you, what comes to mind when you hear the word tradition? Tradition. For me, tradition means keeping the culture. Um, and since we, I'm, I'm Jamaican and I'm Chinese, so for me is keeping the tra Chinese traditions and the Jamaican tradition. You know, Jamaican, I would say the food that we eat and the Chinese definitely is the culture of how we were brought up um, and how we should um, teach our children. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. I don't think we should lose that uh, Jamaican culture food yeah. because that's probably my favorite cuisine. So definitely don't stop cooking. As a matter of fact, we had Aki and Saltfish for breakfast, which listeners, there's probably not one podcast at this point. I haven't talked about food. They're all kind of smirking at me right now. But it, we always end up with food, right? Oh, yeah. This is part of my tradition is, is definitely the food. OK. And so since we're talking about food, what, what is one of your favorite dishes that you like to make? To make uh, maybe oxtail. Yes, I like when you make oxtail. That's yes. good. And the, you know, we made ak and sawfish today. Um, I like to eat healthy. So if you know, we boil the bananas and eat the plantains and so forth. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. So we call that food in Jamaica, right? right. So Jamaican people food. People would say, "Well, what do you mean food? food? Of course it's food." I'm like, "No, no, no, no." But when you boil out the the yam and the potato and all of that, food that is for food. Us <laughs> is all the tuberous roots. You you know, like the sweet potato, the, the potatoes, the um, the boniato, those is so-called food for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 always funny the Jamaican um, right. idioms and, and yeah. different words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always been very interesting, I think, for me growing up because your English is Jamaican patois, but also from the British colonies. And then of course my father's English is, is Chinese English, it's Chinglish. So, yeah, yeah. I, so sometimes I realize even though I learned properly growing up um, in grammar school, uh, there was a lot of, a little bit of confusion. Even with my Chinese, there was confusion. <laughs> so our, 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 um, our um, dynamic of, 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 of language is quite interesting. <laughs> right. Not only that, I've always told people, I said, you know, I have a very interesting family. I said, um, I was born in Jamaica, my husband born in China, uh, Tina born in Florida, Mimi born in Boston. I said, we're all from different parts of the world. <laughs> Absolutely, and we bring it all with us wherever we go. So is there a... Yeah, we didn't even get to talk about this and maybe we'll save that for another podcast but you know you also of course were a singer a professional singer for a really long time a long time from I was oh my gosh 16 years old and I sang with the first all girls band and we did great things all the um all the singers from the United States like Ruby and the Romantics and um even the um Prince Charles and the Queen, they came for the Olympic Games. We were the band chosen to play. Um, I had my own TV show. 
Um, I sang half no with the guitar and sang on the um, TV. Um, I really did a lot of the stuff that was a, a childhood that I don't think anybody else has gone through. So that was in Jamaica, right? In Jamaica. And then when you immigrated to the States, you also continued to sing on the road. Right. At 21, I migrated to the United States. I lived in Brooklyn with my sister. And um, after about six months, I joined up with a group in Buffalo, New York. I flew up there, auditioned. Um, they hired me. And then thereafter, I traveled for about seven years on the road across United States and Canada, as far as Thunder Bay, which is really cold, it's like 40 below zero. Uh, being from Jamaica, you must uh, not have liked Oh, that. I hated that place, but a um, lot of adventures while I was traveling and singing. What was one of your favorite adventures that you can share with our listeners? Oh, dear. Well, a good one or a bad one? <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite, so. <laughs> I don't know, but the one that, favorite, it's not, this is not my favorite, but the one that stuck out was, um, because this is so unusual, is that I always change in between sets. And um, if we have four sets, I would have four change of clothes. So each time I would run inside the room and change my clothes. And we were up in, I think it was Thunder Bay, that's why it dawned on me. And when I went in my room, luckily the band leader came with me to have some fruits or he, he was hungry. And there was somebody in my closet hiding. So I was so fortunate that he was there and we called the cops. Another one was when I was in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Phyllis Diller was staying near a hotel nearby, or it was near a hotel, and she got quarter million dollar for jewelry was stolen. And at that time, I didn't know much about mafia and all that kind of stuff. So I learned quickly, and um, by by being around uh, so many crazy things. I think my favorite would be when Duke Ellington's band was in stayed at the same hotel. And um, Duke Ellington and Marissa, his son, they, they, um, we made friends and they took us on the bus with them to see their show. And I was on backstage right next when Duke Ellington was performing. And, um, you know, they took us back to the hotel. And then I was interviewing some members and Frank, uh, these are Duke Ellington's band members, they would help me to decide which member was good. Um, others is that we were first actor, Frank Sinatra Jr. So I've led a really, really interesting, unusual life. Yeah, you should probably, you know, you authored your Tai Chi book, but maybe you should yeah. sit down yeah. and put pen to paper and talk about your music journey. Right. If I can't remember all the names. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have time for that. It's not like being on a podcast where you have to pull out all these names. But, I, you know, what's funny is, you know, Unfortunately, I think this is how life is. When you think about memorable, you're like, oh my goodness, the first two were like really kind of scary, actually. Right, scary. And then you and then the kind of wound up in some about. good memories. But the scary one, I mean, when you say someone was hiding in the closet, was that to like attack you maybe? Or was he just a rabid fan? Or was he just a crazy person? He was a crazy person, apparently. Mm -hmm. he, uh, yeah, I guess so, because we called the cops right away yeah. and they took him away. So I don't know what he was doing in there. But I mean, it's funny too, because even though, you know, of course that was in the U.S., and, and we do talk about Jamaica has its own dangers, but it was also a really different time. You know, like thinking about just packing up and being on the road now. There's just so much. I would never do it again. <laughs> well, we, I, we, I would you know, never you do told it me now. A fun story that I want you to share actually with our listeners is when you're, I think, um, you hitchhiked, you know, which we, we, we talk about now. Like, I know we see oh, hitchhikers. Oh, the Everest Presley one? <laughs> yes. But you actually did hitchhike, and you would never let me hitchhike. No way. You would way. never recommend I hitchhike, but I it know. worked out really well for you. It was crazy. We were in Las Vegas. 
And you and your sister. And uh, her husband had just passed away, so I said, let's go, you know, um, sightseeing. And so we went to Las Vegas and Hawaii. I don't think my sister will ever, ever, ever forget that trip because c coming with me was already uh, out of this world. We, we were shopping quite a bit on the strip in Las Vegas, and we had so many parcels. We were like just overloaded. We didn't realize how far we walked and how much we bought. And then a car drew up and he, and, and he said, would you girls like a ride? And my sister looked at me like, are you crazy? And I said, oh, it's two of us. What can he do? So I don't know. I was so crazy and adventurous at the time. And I think maybe because I traveled a lot. I was on the road a lot. Everybody I met was a stranger anyway. So I thought it was nice of him to give us a ride. So while he, uh, we were getting the ride, he said, have you seen Elvis Presley? And I said, no, we couldn't get tickets. It sold out. He was singing at the International Hotel at the time when he had just, I think, come back from the Army. So it was first appearance from the Army. So he said, oh, um, I tell you what, um, when you go to go this evening, go to International Drive and give them your name. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'll make arrangements for you. Unfortunately, I never got the man's name. I, I, you know, we just thanked him and he dropped us off. Very nice guy. And that evening, we took the chance we went to International Drive, there was a long line, I mean long lines, but one says, you know, for ticket holder and then VIP. So we went to the VIP and I said, do you have my name? And the guy looked at him and he said, oh yes, this way. He dropped the ropes, took us front seat. We drank champagne we're right under Elvis Presley's nose. And to this day, I don't know the man's name. <laughs> wow. What a treat. Oh, my word. I mean, those are great experiences. But again, I would never do it now. But it was good to be adventurous because I would never have experienced that. Of course. Yeah. Uh, it's good and it's bad, but I would never recommend it to anybody. <laughs> well, you know, that just goes to show you there's real human decency and kindness out there. Oh, and I yeah. think also there's something about the energy and you put off good energy, then good energy comes yeah. into you. I, I really wish I thought I, I, you know, remember his name <laughs> or, or, or asked him his name, you know. But all I remember, he was telling me that, you know, he was sick and he had problems and I was kind of consoling him and I said, don't worry about it, you know, maybe being such a positive person myself, maybe I was giving this positive karma yeah. i don't know what it was but well, it definitely worked we, out we lucked out and we lucked and out Annie. so how was the performance oh fantastic fantastic it, you know uh, but my three best love singers is elvis presley michael jackson and with Houston. So they're all gone now, but um, they will always live on for me. Yeah, yeah, wonderful performers and, um, and very memorable. Oh, yes. Well, my vacation is very memorable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately, I don't have any amazing hitchhiker stories where I got free tickets to sit under uh, any music icon that will never get to be seen and again. And it's free and drink champagne. And drink, yes. So, but, uh, but I think I've had quite enough luck in, in my life as well, so I'm oh, not going to yes. complain. Yeah, but um, complain. That thing you take after me. <laughs> yeah, so I've got, that, I've got the karma. But um, thank you for sharing your story. And I, you know, I urge people to go on Line and then look at all the links you know there'll be a lot of the things that she shared and most importantly some pictures of her in her stage uh, outfits which you know uh, from our movie that was like the best feedback everyone was always <laughs> jealous of those go-go boots yeah. and so if you want to see the go-go boots please log on online all right thanks so much mom thanks ma'am that's all for today's episode thanks for listening to the sifu mimi chan show 
Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.